Hi, I'm Gary with Gary's Wine and Marketplace here with Eugenia Keegan. And Eugenia, you know, we we have met a handful of times last year at the Willamette auction, which we're going to talk about. We got to spend a lot of time uh, chatting, but I had no idea until I read your bio of all the amazing things you've done and where you've come from. It says deep roots in Sonoma, Russian mm -hmm. River. Does that mm -hmm. mean you you're, you were born there or does it mean you work there? Uh, both. I was born there uh, a very long time ago. That's why that biography reads as long as it does. Uh, and I grew up in Sonoma County and Russian River. So I'm a fifth generation from Sonoma County. Long, long time farming family from Sonoma. And were they farming, not grapes back in the yes. early days? Well, oh. they started out in, uh, it's a really interesting sort of history of Sonoma County agriculture. They started with cattle uh, and then it moved to hops, of course. And uh, that was uh, knocked out by mildew. And then they moved to beans for a couple of years because beans go up those poles and hops have those poles. So it was a way of using the infrastructure. Oh, that's hysterical. So, yeah, and that was just a few years. And then all of that came out and prune trees went in. Um, and uh, if you look at Sonoma County, the Sebastopol area was, was apples and the northern Hillsburg area was prunes. And then prunes made way finally for grapes. So the first grapes on the family farm were planted in about 1945. Wow, that's amazing. And if you go to Sebastopol now, there's still some orchards. Yes, I've, I've had some great apples from there. I'm not Gravenstein. gonna lie. Gravenstein. Yes, yeah, they're, they're um, and I had no Gravenstein. idea. You know, we were driving to the coast and we went through there and I saw all these things. So we stopped and I had some, it was fantastic. So then you went on and you were a winemaker in Napa for years in the seventies. Yeah, I was in uh, Napa for about 15 years, and uh, I finally had to sell my house in Sonoma and move over to the other side, um, because, of course, that's where the business was. And it's probably less so today, but it was quite divided. And I don't mean divided and they didn't like each other. It's just that that mountain range just completely, it was like they were in two different worlds. Um, so uh, it was really important to move over to Napa. So I was there right. for quite a while. And it is, it, to, to me, it, it still feels like two different worlds to me, totally yeah. honest. But, but let's get to let's get to Oregon, because that's what we're talking about, right? You're now the uh, general manager and vice president of Oregon Wine Operations and Business Development for Jackson Family. That's a full mouthful. What, what does that mean to me? So um, I've actually uh, moved on from that role. I forgot, Gary, we should have updated you. Oh, my um, God, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. Last August, I turned that role over to my colleague, Matthew Farver. And what it means is uh, when a, a water pipe breaks or a compressor goes down, they don't call me anymore. They, they call, call that. that. <laughs> That's what it means. So I've just moved up to uh, head of Oregon winemaking. Uh, and I'm spending a lot more time with the enterprise as a whole and with our Californian colleagues, et cetera, working on actually super fun stuff, kind of future proofing. Well, we'll talk for a, a bit about Jackson family, but you know, they've got 50 wineries around the world and Barbara is always looking for new opportunities. So with climate change, instead of more investment in California, we're looking the, at the rest of the globe and I get to do a little globe trotting on that uh, for that. So it's really fun. That's awesome. She once said to me that she doesn't enjoy uh, shoe shopping nearly as much as vineyard shopping. Right. I, I contend that Barbara Benke has probably seen more vineyards in this world than any other human being alive. When you I, think about I, I it. believe it. And, and yeah. I think that of all the people I've ever met, her passion for the vineyard first. Yes. Right. She the, a, a label can come. She'll figure out what to do or, or she'll have her team figure out what to do with the fruit. Right. But what well, she. Well, well, that's Grand Moraine and Zena Crown, to, to exactly to your point. She bought those vineyards, and they were called Grand Moraine and Zena Crown. We did not name them, but we created brands. They're two, as you know, very, very distinct vineyards in, in different uh, AVAs. And so we created a brand called Grand Moraine and one called Zena Crown based on those estates. And that is her model. Yeah, and we're going to talk about those in a minute. The same right. thing is like... Uh, for those of us watching that don't know Willamette that well, if you think of Cardinal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great estate that that uses Jackson family fruit from all the mountains. Correct. Um, but then you have La Coya, 
that has the individual uh, mountains. You know, they they don't blend right. in it as well. I think right. Grand Moraine would be this the same discussion as that goes. So yeah. so we're talking about uh, you know Willamette Valley, of course, and Oregon, and we're in Oregon Wine Month. Uh, tell us what that means to you and what that means to the consumer. Yeah, several years ago, probably 10 or 12 by now, the governor created May as Oregon Wine Month, which was fun. And, and there's a nice big long declaration that's signed and, you know, a scroll. But it didn't mean much for a while until the Oregon Wine Board and a collection of individual wineries decided that this was an opportunity. And we had seen uh, March as Washington Wine Month, and they were very successful with a global promotion. And we started uh, really getting together as a community. And so it's just, it's a real focus and it's a focus for uh, distribution and retail such as yourself to really um, highlight the incredible wines of Oregon and the Willamette Valley for this one month and really um, ask your consumers to come in and experience it with you. I love that it's it experience it because it's not one size fits all. And it, as when we get to some of the labels we're going to talk about, they're so distinctly, distinctively different, right? Yeah. And yes. that's what makes it exciting. It's it's not uh, monolithic. Uh, no, not at that's, all. It's it. They're so diverse. The soils are diverse. Uh, the winemaking philosophies are, are very different. Um, and what ends up in the bottle is very different. I'm going to start uh, with Graham Rain. Um, and as we talked my right before, project. my passion because, project, because because the Graham Rain is probably and don't tell the Napa team, right? If you tell Chris Carpenter, I'm going to be very upset. Uh, Graham Rain is probably uh, one of my fa single favorite Jackson family properties, as well as Zena Crown. Um, well, the that, good news, Gary, is that they're over in the Cabernet family and we're over in the Pinot Noir family. I know, so, so, so it's like fine. The I, way, just like the way you talk about your children, uh, right? This can be your favorite Pinot project, right? You got a deal. So the first thing I want to talk about, but I am going to taste it because the first time I had it was last year. Uh, we did a tasting of all Grand Moraine and we tasted mm -hmm. the bubble. So this is the Grand Moraine Brut Rosé. Um, before I got to the winery last year, I didn't, and I'm looking to see if it's not vintage, right? It is not vintage, correct. Oh, no, it is. It's, uh, it's discord. I'm sorry, it's discouraged in 2022, yep. 2022. It's 52% uh, Pinot Noir, 44% Chardonnay, and 4% Pinot Meunier. Yes. Uh, so what can you tell me about it while I'm opening it? So it was really fun in when we started Grand Marine in 2013. And of course, we were going to make Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. That's what you do in the Willamette Valley. And uh, but we were very convinced, my associate Shane Moore, uh, who's now the winemaker at Grand Marine, uh, we, we were convinced that bubbles had a place in the future. And uh, we spent quite a bit of time researching it, which perhaps was the most fun part of the project when you have to taste a couple hundred wines to, to, to agree upon style. Uh, and that's uh, what we did. And we decided we were going to do the Brut Rosé and a Blanc de Blanc. And we were going to really give it the attention that great champagnes get. So it's uh, usually three years um, entourage so that we get those lovely, very fine bubbles that you get the longer I, you leave it. The Blanc de Blanc you, stays on seven years. You just, yes, you can see the bubbles. You, you see it. And I yeah. love, and I remember this, the other, and we were sitting outside, it was beautiful, and you guys had a food and wine pairing for us, which made it even better. But you look at the color, and it's like that light salmon hue, uh, and then the bubbles are really fine, and it smells delicious. And you touched on something that is that is also, I wanted to bring up, and uh, Shane Moore. Yes, Shane uh, talk Moore. Of, uh, Shane, right? Did I say yeah, right? Yeah, Shane Moore. Yep, you got yeah. it right. Yep. Uh, uh, Shane and I were the first, I was the first uh, employee uh, on the Oregon payroll, but Shane was already um, a member of Jackson Family Wines working in Sonoma County, but he's a Pacific Northwest boy. So he had raised his hand early on for any Oregon uh, projects. And once uh, we bought Grand Moraine and Zena Crown Vineyards, he came up to Oregon and he and I established uh, Grand Moraine and Zena Crown. And um, 
he, when we bought uh, Penner Ash Winery and then Willa Kenzie, I moved up uh, into a full over uh, general manager role and Shane stepped in uh, full time to the winemaking roles. And he is an iconoclast if there's ever been one. And he had to choose between being a rock and roll music star or a winemaker. Uh, but clearly star was attached to his name no matter what he decided to do. He's brilliant. He's quirky. He's fun. Um, he, he lives and breathes wine. He, he does every day he comes to work with a new idea of something he wants to be doing. And he, and he exudes, exudes energy. I mean, yes. you know, I've met him probably three or four times now and we've done a Zoom tasting together three years ago. The, the energy that comes off of him. And, and the word I think about is the same thing I get in the nose of this wine and, and the, the flavor, character. Yes, character. He's a, yeah. he's a character. And this yeah. wine has a lot of character. The, you know, the aromatics, are it's kind of that yeasty, you get a little bit of yeastiness in it. And you get a little of perfume and like, almost like strawberry, um, but it's got, it's finished as bone dry. And it's got mm -hmm. a great level of acidity. This, this, um, these bubbles are are truly as memorable as they were uh, when I had them last year. Uh, this is the first time I've retasted it. Um, and talk about limited production. I don't know how many cases you produce, but it's not hundreds. No, we we we've, we're up to about twelve hundred now. On oh, that. it is you know, okay. Well, we've been building stock since two thousand and fourteen. Um, and that's allowed us to uh, sort of build every year and build our reserve uh, so that we can make even a more complex wine as we continue to move forward with that. But it's that real refreshing component that is so important to us. We want that last glass in a bottle of bubbles to be just as exciting as that first glass, you know, which is fresh and you, you're starting a celebration when you open it and um, but it is, there's a lot of depth in that wine for what is sort of a rosé. It's got just loads of, loads of character and depth. It's true. It's character depth. Uh, it's food oriented. I mean, you can mm -hmm. definitely, I, I can't remember what the pairing was because uh, we had oysters with one pairing and that might have been the, the Blanc de Blanc. Um, but it's just, it, it was great with food. Uh, the next one I want to mention is the Grand Marain, uh Chardonnay. Yep. Oops, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, it's the 2019. You want to tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, uh, thank you. I'd be delighted. That's sort of the passion project for Grand Moraine for me. We were pretty, um, we, we, we felt pretty confident that we could make a, a Pinot Noir of good character and quality. We, we, after all, it's a brilliant vineyard and we had a lot of, uh, a lot of experience between the two of us. But we also knew that we weren't going to make something mind blowing because there are already so many fantastic Pinot Noirs coming out of Oregon. We were just hoping to hold our head up with the best of them. But Chardonnay was really uh, coming into this new renaissance in Oregon, and we had a uh, big opportunity to make a statement about Chardonnay. My, I did my uh, Chardonnay stage at Etienne Sauzet uh, yeah. in Burgundy, so I had some serious background and had longed to make Chardonnay in Oregon because I knew we could get that acid profile that is so important to the longevity and the character of great Chardonnay. So we started out with a very different style than the rest of Jackson family. And they kept poking us wondering if we'd ever put it in the bottle because, you know, we were leaving it 20 months in the barrel and, and that was uh, not customary. But you can see, I think, from the wine, um, we pick very early. We try and pick, and this is true for Pinot Noir as well, right on the edge of ripeness because we, we want to be sure that we're getting lower alcohol and, and a lot of freshness. Um, and I think people have tended to wait too long to pick Chardonnay. And as a community, we've learned that now. So uh, whenever I talk to our California winemakers and tell them we pick at 1920 bricks, they think we've lost our minds and don't know what we're doing. Um, and then they taste the wine. And so for the consumer, bricks is sugar. Yes, and... bricks is pretty much percent sugar in the grapes. Right. And California right now, they're 22, 23, aren't they, for Chardonnay? At least, at least maybe 24. Um, yeah. They're looking for that real uh, tropical uh, peach-like set of flavors. And we're really picking on pH and acid. Right. And and when I taste it, the difference I get is, and, and I didn't know how much time it sat on wood, because I don't get that at all. No. no. What I get is, 
is aromatics and mineral, right? Yeah. I, I, you know, it it just fills my mouth with flavor, and then it's textural, and then it's mineral, and and it it's acidic, you know, but not not too, it's not overly acidic. It doesn't like dry me out, but it just got great balance and structure, and and it's a, I, it, it's twenty five dollars, give or take thirty dollars. It's a uh, reasonably priced uh, Chardonnay. Yep. Um, well, we we use uh, pun- we use the punchins so that we we have the bigger the bigger container so that there's uh, a good amount of oxidation, uh, and we buy maybe one new punchin a year, so it's in the 10, 12, 15 percent depending upon volume, and so it gets a little that little kiss, but we really are not about uh, new oak, so we don't use oak or alcohol to prop up the wine. Right. So that's a good, so punchin, how big, is, what's the volume, the volume Five, of the punchin? 500. They're 500s. 500s, which is how many bottles of wine or how many cases? Uh, boy, I only know it for the barrique, which is 25, yeah. so maybe right. 75. Yeah, so so that's yeah. the, the point I wanted to make is, is a traditional barrique barrel is about 25 cases. Uh, yes. So if you think about the volume of liquid to the the barrel to the wood, whether it's new or one year old, you're going to get a lot of that wood to the uh, to liquid to the barrel. Liquid you know, to the wood barrel, right, right. In this, it's triple the size. So you have triple the liquid. Uh, so much less liquid is being touched one to one, in essence, right. with the wood, and it's also older. So even though it is sitting in wood barrels, it's not sitting in new wood, and it's a much greater volume. So it's getting the nuance in my mind of wood, but not the lumberjack. But, but not the lumber. Yes, not the two by four. And right. really, you know, barrel aging has been a little misunderstood over the years. It's really about slow and controlled oxidation. It's not really about that flavor. And we've sort of shifted that as winemakers a little bit. But we're, as I said, you know, I worked in France and we, we it's very traditional what we do. I mean, it's absolutely traditional. And so we're trying to get that oxidation without getting the the buttery or woody flavor. Right. That's, that's awesome. And the wines speak to themselves, speak for themselves. Uh, Siduri. Now, this yep. is a brand that's pretty near to my heart for a couple reasons. One is it's really a, it was a, a Sonoma winery. Mm-hmm. And one of our employees from New Jersey uh, fell in love with wine working for us while he was in college and came out here and worked for Siduri for about three years. Oh, oh wow. Uh, before you guys bought it. And now you bought it and helped take a great wine to a, a, whole, a whole new level. Um, so what can you tell me about the Siduri 2021 Willamette Pinot Noir? Well, interestingly enough, um, Adam Lee, who founded Siduri, and the goal was to make Pinot Noir up and down the, the West Coast. So he went all the way from Santa Barbara, believe it or not, to Oregon. So he started Siduri in 1994 and began bringing in fruit from Oregon in 1995. So there was a lot of tradition with the brand to be in the Willamette Valley. And we have augmented what he was doing, which was primarily out of the Shehalem Mountains with the Jackson family estate fruit. And I think that that's been the biggest change is the quality of the fruit sourcing. And of course, you know, we're farming uh, precision farming for a, a wine like Siduri. So there's more opportunity to blend in complexity um, and depth because of the fruit sourcing. So there's some Xena Crown in there, there's some Grand Moraine in there, uh, and there's a little Willa Kenzie fruit in there from that estate. So we're able to choose from all the estates. There's Jury Hills and the Dundee Hills. So it, it, it allows us to build in as a Willamette Valley bottling, a lot of complexity. And where is it bottled? Is it bottled in Willamette now? Yes, yes, we have a winery in McMinnville. Um, we built a new winery, but we built it in an industrial park because that's what it is. Um, and so we uh, we uh, grow all the fruit, and make all the wine, bottle it in the Willamette Valley. It does not go to California and back. It, it used to. In when, yes, it used to when Adam owned it. You're absolutely when right. Adam. It, so when I visited California, my my yep. former employee was working there, so I visited in a harvest one year, yep. and he had a truck, and they had the dry ice on top. Yep. That's right. And I and I was like, because I had never seen that. It's got to be. T- How long have you owned? It has to be twenty five years ago, twenty yeah. years ago. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. We bought it in 15. So he was trucking fruit down from 95 to 2015. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. So you think about just that little thing that, that Jackson family can do for a brand. Yes. That, you know, and he did a great job getting the brand going, but you've taken it and elevated it because of Barbara's vineyards that she likes to buy. And, yes, you know, yeah, yeah, all the way there. back to, uh, you know, you, we all and, say it starts in the vineyard and nobody believes that more than Barbara Banky. Oh, absolutely. And to the point of, of this wine, it's it's what I would call classic Willamette. It just mm-hmm. drinks beautifully. It's got great berry flavors and it's it's you don't have to think about it. You know, it's screw top. Uh, so yeah, God forbid you don't. Point that out. You can get right God to for, it. God forbid you don't finish it, which is a a, a, a sin in its own right. Uh, but if you don't finish it, it's fine. You put the, you just put the screw top on. Um, so what I did though is while you were talking, I corvined because I'm spoiled. Oh yeah, yeah. So the, this is the baby, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is the Zena Crown uh, Vineyard, uh, 2016. Uh, these wines age beautifully. So while I have the uh, pleasure of smelling, swirling, tasting, uh, tell us about it. The Zena. Yes, please. Yeah. So the Zena Crown Vineyard uh, is in the Eola Amity Hills. And, you know, we don't have the, the crew system that they have in Burgundy, but there are uh, blocks on that vineyard that are undisputably um, Grand Cru. Uh, not the whole vineyard, of course, it could never be like that, but it's um, the vineyard's in high demand. We have a waiting list for fruit. We try and sell fruit to our neighbors and friends. Um, and of course, the Zena Crown brand, you talk about limited. It's very limited. We're bottling um, only 300 cases or so of each of those. So the sum is probably 300 cases, maybe 350. Uh, actually, in 16, it was probably closer to 250. Uh, we've been inching it up a little bit. And there's a limit to the the Grand Cru A plus site, so that brand has a has a total limit of what we can do with it, and it we get the choice of the all the blocks, which was you know we had fun doing that. Not our some of our friends didn't have as much fun when we were elbowing them out of spots, but um, we it it the wine is. It, I remember tasting it all all together one time, all all bottlings with a with a wine writer. And I realized after about an hour, those wines are truly profound. It's a word I don't use with wine very often, but they are profound. And you could sit with that wine for 10 hours and it would never let you down in that evolution of 10 hours. It would evolve um, and it would you know, be a different wine as it aerated, but they're, they're ta- there's no depth. I mean, you can't, it's layered and layered and layered and layered. It, it's funny because I'm I'm getting I'm I'm tasting I'm 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 enjoying it, um, and that's the the term I'm I'm going through is layers, right? I don't get that big jammy, no. I don't get the bright fruit, I'm not getting high acidity to be honest, but I'm getting layers of flavor, and la- every time I taste it, it tastes different, and it comes out right. slightly different, and and it's got a little bit of that I want to say earthiness, but not 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 dark earth but it's just that soft almost like dusty earth um yes. just great richness and what i love about that is you know sometimes pinot noir can be all the way over in the fruit category or all the way over in the sort of souvoir forestry uh, earthy and this has all of it. It it, it 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 has it all it's funny i haven't had it in a long time and but i chose what wisely because I said I can't taste five six wines at this point in a half hour a it'll take too long b it, it's too much uh but I chose to this is my uh choice for tonight's dinner but it is uh it's scrumptious it, it's got yeah. everything you're looking for um and then I wanted to put this down I'm, and I want to talk about I have a surprise here uh-oh Oh, wow, the barrel auction wine. Fantastic. So we, we bought, uh, so for the last few years, so so this is the uh, Grand Moraine um, Pinot Noir 2019. Uh, Terminal Moraine. Yes. Uh, bottle number 49 of 60. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the first time I bought it. Two years in a row I bought the Zena Crown. Mm-hmm. 
uh, but I couldn't afford it last year. Uh, and and truly the Xena crown, and I think I still have some left in New Jersey, uh, which is why I didn't show it here today, are, it was probably the best Pinot Noir I've ever had in my life. It, from the United States. I've had some French ones with some initials on it uh, that probably were, were better, but also maybe a little bit more expensive. Uh, oh. But but this uh, Grand Moraine uh, Willamette Auction Pinot is so special um, and spectacular and only 60 bottles produced. You want to tell us a little bit about the Willamette Auction? Yes, I'd be delighted. It's coming up again on August 10th this year. We look forward to hanging out with you again. Uh, we'll see what other treasures we can we can share with you this year. And this is a fundraiser for the Willamette Valley Wineries Association. It is really our marketing budget for the year. And so it's very precious to us as we get to you help support us in, in the Willamette Valley. And we hope to turn that right back around to you in, in the form of excellent wines. Um, and it's a joy. It's uh, it's now, when did we start? 1987, uh, I think 2017. Um, I was the chair in 2019, the co-chair actually with Shirley Brooks. And we've added to it every year as we've sort of learned and, and we're able to get one event correct. And then we add another event and you'll see that we added another event this year, which is a fantastic dinner in McMinnville a long banquet dinner in down in a, uh, on a side street. We've taken That's over awesome. the entire side street. There'll be 250 people in, in banquet form dining outdoors. Um, lots of wine will be flowing. And uh, so it's a week of, of, of eating and drinking and merriment and camaraderie and community. And it's uh, we look forward to it every year because it's the one time we get to bring in our trade partners. <laughs> You know, obviously we do lots of consumer things, but this uh, is an opportunity to meet with people like you that are gatekeepers. Without you, we are we, we, we get nowhere. Well, I appreciate that. And I got to tell you, um, the first time I fell in love with Willamette was at International Pinot Noir Celebration. Uh -huh. That yeah. was a great event. But then I've been to uh, the Willamette auction now three times. Yep. Um, and each time, A, the quality of the event event gets better but the wines have gotten truly better and better you know the the 19s are, are, are to me spectacular spectacular wines. spectacular wines, you know yeah. and it also introduced me to the vintage which yeah. got me to buy more of those vintages when when suppliers came to me you know uh to say hey or would you be interested in my 19 vintage and i don't need to wait wait for a wine critic uh, you, you know, know Gary, we, th we thank you for that. You make a really good reminder there that each year we focus on a vintage. I mean, the, the you right. know, rolling forward. So we're on the 22 vintage this year, I think it is. So 21, 22. And uh, so er so the beauty of that is that you get a very, very full uh, view, not, not bigger than a snapshot of a vintage because you're tasting one vintage all the way through. And to your point, uh, you end up with either an enormous amount of confidence in the in that vintage, or you understand that it was warmer or cooler or wetter, and and what what that specific year brings to that wine. Right, and you find also in in some years sites are very well; they're always very important. But some years sites performed better, yes. um, and that's great to know. And then we we bid against our our friends. Yes. Uh, uh, so you're not getting this. These are not value wines, uh, but no. you but they are unique, one of a kind. Trust me, uh, uh, Shane uh, went above and beyond finding the best barrel uh, for this wine. Um, and that's what the winemakers are told to do. Make the best wine. And they do. That's right. That's right. And we it's, put five it's a, cases to bed and the and the deal is find something and they're unique. So you you won't find that wine in any other bottle. The, you you literally go through the cellar to create a singular wine unique for the auction. And and it's it's spectacular. And guess what? If you go to Gary'sWine.com and look up Willamette Auction Wine, uh, we have some left in New Jersey and some left in California. Uh, so depending on the vintage and the, the you know the year, 
Uh, some we shipped in New, New Jersey, some we shipped to California. Uh, but well, it's, not, great not fair to, it's, not, it's not fair to keep it all in one state. You got to spread it, spread uh, the love around. Got to share. I, I think sharing is very important. Uh, okay. But but uh, I want to take, the, I want to, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I, I know uh, you're in Tokyo, uh, right? Yes, you had to get up. Yes, breakfast, bre breakfast time in Tokyo. You had to get up very early in order to, to, to do this, uh, and I greatly appreciate it. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, in August at the Willamette uh, auction um, and breaking bread and drinking some spectacular bubbles, maybe to start with you, if if I could make a suggestion of what I would be interested in. Consider it a date. Consider it okay. a date. Uh, the, the time and place will be uh, defined, uh, but yet to be defined, but we'll break out some Blanc de Blanc and we'll get the week started well. That's great. Thank you so much for your time and enjoy and have a safe trip. Thanks, Gary. Great to talk Take to care. you. Bye. Ciao.